All right. In this one, we're going to model the Golden Sand Slick Park in Hangzhou. It's a really nice project. You'll notice the patterns kind of fade in and out across the surface. We can probably use some attractor based effect to make that happen later on. So first, let's talk about how we're going to model this. The best way to go is to build the base geometry using SubD. Then we'll handle the patterns separately in Grasshopper. We're going to begin right from the center around this main circle or ellipse and we'll build our sub D outward from there. Let's expand our top view. In this view, I'm gonna start by creating a circle. We'll place it right at the world origin. Just type zero, hit enter. Let's set the radius to about 14.5 meters. We're gonna duplicate it for the second one. So hold down Alt and drag it in the X direction. I'm gonna drag it about 86 meters. Then move it in the Y somewhere around 28 meters. I'm just experimenting with the dim dimensions. You can copy mine or just trace over it. We'll scale it in the Y direction to make it elliptical and rotate it somewhere around 55 to 56 degrees. All right, now I'll go to gumball orientation and set it to align to object. From here, I'll just, I'll just tweak the shape of it, scale it and modify as needed. All right. Now, based on those two curves, we're going to build our base surface. So I'm going to select both curves, go to the curve menu and hit rebuild. Let's rebuild them with a point count of eight and make sure sub D friendly is turned on. Then hit OK. Now let's offset this one. First, I'll set the gumball orientation back to world. Then hold down shift plus alt and drag to make a copy. I'll do the same thing with the circle. Select it, hold shift plus alt and drag it up to make a duplicate. All right, now select each pair of curves. We're gonna loft them. Go to the sub D tab, choose loft, press enter, and again, enter to confirm. Repeat that for the other pair, just select both and hit enter twice. Now we're gonna blend those two forms together. First, let's delete this part. I'll hold control plus shift. Select those interfaces and delete them. Now that we're done with the base curves, let's hide them for now. Then head over to the SubD tools and we'll use the bridge tool. Select the first edge, hit enter, then select the second one and hit enter again. In the bridge settings, you can control how many segments you want. Let's set it to three segments. We can also tweak the transition using the straightness slider. I'll set that to around 40%, then hit OK. Now we'll do the same thing on the other side. Just press enter to run the last command. So at the first edge, hit enter, then the second one, enter again. This time, I'll bump the straightness up to around 60% and hit OK. All right, now hit tab to switch into polygon view. This shows the low res mesh underneath the smooth surface. Hold down Control plus Shift, select the faces and use the gumball to rotate and align them a bit better, just enough so both sides become roughly parallel. Once that's done, let's run the bridge tool again. Select the first side, press enter, then the second one, enter again. And this time, we'll keep it simple. Just set the segment count to one. Cool. Now we're gonna build a second layer on top of this form. Basically, we're working on the outer shell and smoothing it out gradually until it starts to match our design. First, go ahead and use the cell edge loop command to grab the outer edge loop. Once that's selected, use the extrude sub D command to start pulling it out. If you don't see anything happening, try changing the direction to face normal or vertex normal. That usually fixes it. Then just drag it up or down to control the extrusion distance. I'll place more in somewhere around here. Hold down control plus shift. Select some vertices and start aligning them. Just use the gumball to nudge them. Feel free to make any necessary adjustments here using the reference image as a guide. I'll speed this part up a bit in the video. Basically, select the vertices or edges and push them up or down until it matches the form. Try to keep the chords evenly spaced and square-ish. That'll help later when we apply patterns. Once that looks good, we're gonna extrude this one more time. This will be our outer edges. Again, select the edge loop and use the extrude sub D command. This time, just pull it out a little. 
Repeat the process. Hold Control plus Shift. Select the vertices, edges, or faces and adjust the shape. Use your reference and move things around until the exterior feels right compared to the reference. I'll fast forward again here. Next, let's switch to perspective view and move the whole sub D up by 16 meters in the Z direction. Then select the border edge loop and move it down by the same value, minus 16 meters. So we get the side facade area, but this creates a blobby transition from the roof to the side. Let's make this a hard transfer. So select this edge loop, then go to the sub decrease tools and right click to apply a hard crease. You'll see that gives us a straight, sharp transition along that edge. Right now it's a bit too flat, like a straight inclined wall. So next we'll give it a bit more curvature on that side. We're going to use the expand edge command here. Just double click the base edge loop to select it and hit enter. That'll create a new loop along the selected loop. In the offset settings, let's set it to small and hit enter. Now select the new edge loop we just added and move it up slightly, a bit in the Z direction. That gives us a little bit of raised thickness on the side. Next up, we're going to start shaping those openings. Just sliding certain edge loops upward will do the trick. I'll use the slide command and select the edge loops that define where the openings will go. Just slide those up or down, depending on how the form is supposed to pop out. Now I'm going to repeat the slide command a few times over different areas. To speed that up, you can type asterisk and slide that'll repeat the command each time it finishes. So I'll start sliding these edges here, then do the same thing on this other side, slide them up. You can also just select vertices and slide those too. Same idea. For this section, I'm actually going to slide things down a bit. Since in the 3D reference, the roof isn't perfectly flat, it dips slightly, so I'm adjusting both sides to match that shape. Okay, now let's continue and start preparing the surface for the pattern. One important thing here, we need the quads to be evenly distributed and roughly squarish. Right now, they're a bit stretched, more like rectangular-ish. So I'll select the full sub D and run the subdivide command once. Now it looks even more rectangular, but we just need to simply reduce the loops in the horizontal direction to get them more square. Use cell edge loop and select every other horizontal loop, leaving one in the middle, then press enter and delete them. Now it's getting closer, but still not quite there. Go ahead and select the sub D and run the subdivide command one more time to add more geometry. Then just like before, we're going to clean things up by selecting alternating horizontal edge loops, skip the one in the middle, and delete them. Once that's done, you'll start seeing a more even distribution and a cleaner quad layout. But if you look closely, some of the faces in this area are still too tight and dense. So I'll go through and delete another set of edge loops, again skipping the one in the middle. Now we've got a pretty evenly spaced squarish quad grid. Let's run one last subdivision. The pattern density later on will depend on how dense the sub D is. So if you want a denser pattern, make sure to add more subdivisions now. Next, we're going to turn this grid into triangle panels using Grasshopper. I've already made a tutorial showing how to do this manually. You can check that out later if you're interested. But for this one, we'll handle it entirely in Grasshopper. So let's go ahead and open Grasshopper. Just type Grasshopper into the command bar. All right. First, let's bring our sub D into Grasshopper. Double click in the Grasshopper canvas, search for sub D container and add it to the canvas. Right click on it and set it to the sub D from Rhino. Then hide the sub D in Rhino so we can clearly see what's happening in Grasshopper. Next, we want to convert this into horizontal or vertical mesh strips. To do that, first we'll convert the sub D to a mesh by passing it through a mesh container. And we need two components for this, mesh direction and mesh stripper. Connect the mesh into mesh direction and then feed that into mesh stripper. Now right click on the output and beg the result. You'll see the mesh is broken up into strip like loops. You may see vertical or horizontal strips. In my case, it's horizontal loops. If you've got vertical strips, just add a mesh turn component between them. 
They'll rotate the direction and give you horizontal strips instead. But for me, the default horizontal strips are perfect. So I'm going to keep it like that. Now we'll diagonalize the mesh. We'll use diagonalize. So each quad gets split into two triangles with one diamond panel in the middle. All we need to do is split those diamonds horizontally. That's how we'll get our final pattern. Now, before we split the diamonds, we need to filter out the right faces, only the ones with four corners. What I'm going to do now is use the face boundaries component. I'll connect the diagonalized mesh into it, and that gives us a closed polyline for each face. From there, we only want to keep the diamond panels, and all of those have exactly four corners. So to filter those out, we'll first use discontinuity. That gives us the corner points from each of those face boundaries. And now, from that list of corners, we'll extract only the ones that have four points per branch, which means they come from the diamond panels. To do that, I'm going to use the prune tree component, connect the points to it, and set both the minimum and maximum item count to four. That filters out just the branches that have exactly four items. Next, I'll use a list item to separate those four points into individual outputs. I'm going to zoom in and add three more outputs. So we'll have one for each corner of the diamond. Now we just need to connect the corners using the line. Start from the first point to the third one, skipping the one in the middle. This gives us a vertical line. But since we want a horizontal split, I'll test connecting from the second to the fourth point instead. That gives us a horizontal line. And now you'll start seeing the pattern emerge. Now we just need to merge those lines with the existing mesh wireframe so we can create a new mesh with this pattern. I'll use the mesh edges component on the diagonalized mesh. That gives us the edges we want to merge with our new lines. But before we merge, let's take a look at the data structure. I will drop in a param viewer so we can compare things. For the mesh edges, both naked and closed, I've got 12 branches in my case, but the new lines we just made have over 1300 branches, so we need to match them first. I'll use the trim tree component to remove the top level branches. Now it matches the mesh structure. Once that's done, we can merge both edge sets together. Now the output should also have the same branch structure. At this point, I'll use Weaverbird's mesh from lines component. Connect the combined wireframe, and that gives us the new patterned mesh. You'll notice some areas look a bit stretched, we'll fix that shortly. Before we move on, let's clean it up using Combine and Clean. Then flatten it to merge everything into a single mesh. Okay, now we're going to turn those mesh patterns into frames. First, I'm going to extract the boundaries of each panel. We'll use the face boundaries component again. Now to scale them from the center, I'll use the area component, the centroid will be our scaling center. For the scale factor, let's just set a fixed number for now. Something between 0 and 1, depending on how thick you want the frames. Next, we'll merge the original outlines with the scaled down versions. Once that's set, we can go ahead and create a loft between each pair. But first, make sure to graft both inputs. This will put two items in the same branches, so we can loft them together. We'll use the mesh loft component. This one's from the Chromadorus plugin. All the plugins used in this video, like mesh loft, are linked in the description, so you can install them first and then continue following along here. After that, I'll clean things up using Combine and Clean, and let's give it a quick custom preview. I'll assign a light gray material just to see the result more clearly. Here's what it looks like. Each panel has a small opening in the middle, but it's a bit plain right now. All the openings are the same size, and it's not that interesting visually. So next, we're going to add some variation. We'll control the opening size using a gradient based on how far each panel is from the edge. Let's scroll back up to the start of the definition. I'm going to extract the boundary edges from the original sub D. First, we'll convert the source sub D into a breadth. Then I'll use breadth edges and extract the naked edges. These give us the outer boundary curves of the breadth. Let's bring those curves forward. They're going to act as our attractor curves. Based on the distance between each panel and these attractors, 
we'll be able to control how big or small the openings are. Now we're going to use the pull point component. We'll use the centers of the panels as the points and the attractor curves as the geometry we're pulling to. The result will give us the distance from each panel to the nearest part of the edge. Next, we'll remap that distance to control the opening sizes. For the source domain, I'll use the bounds component. And for the target domain, let's build one using construct domain. I'll set it from zero to something like 0 0.999, just under one. Now you'll start noticing the effect. Panels that are closer to the edges open up more and the ones further away close down. If you're seeing weird black shading or inverted lighting inside the panels, that's probably a normal issue. So after Combine and Clean, I'll run Unify Normals to fix it. At this point, everything's working. Now let's give it some thickness using We The Birds Mesh Thicken. Connect the final unified mesh into it and set the thickness to around 0.12 meters. You'll see the result immediately. We've got thickness now, but if you zoom in, some of the shading still looks weird. That's probably because of automatic welding or smoothing. So I'll use the unweld mesh component. Set the angle to zero degrees and that should fix all the shading artifacts. And that's basically it. You can now control the thickness, the distance based scaling and tweak the attractor curves however you want. Feel free to play around with the values and test different effects. All right, that wraps up this video. If you want access to the final Grasshopper script and the project files, they're available on Patreon. Thanks for watching, and if you liked this video, you'll definitely like the next one too, and I will see you there.